Hello geographers, welcome to this revision video about sediment cells. Within this video we're going to be examining the concept of a sediment cell, um, looking at some of the sources and sinks of sediment that exist within these cells um, and considering the concept of sediment budgets as well. Probably worth us starting by defining what we mean by a sediment cell. So as we can see in this definition on the left hand side, we can define a sediment cell as a stretch of coastline within which the processes of erosion and transportation and deposition um, operate and the movement of sediment is largely self-contained. That's a really important concept that um, within a sediment cell, sediment is moved around within the cell but it doesn't really move from one cell to the next. So therefore we can, we can consider them as being closed systems. Um, in reality, a little bit of sediment does move from one sediment cell to the next, um, but broadly speaking, the sediment is simply cycled around within an area rather than moving from one area to another. So in the context of this map on the right hand side, um, we can see how the UK is divided up um, into different sediment cells. So there's one, for example, um, that runs from um, Portland Bill in the, uh, in the south of England um, to Selsey Bill in, in Sussex and another one that runs from Selsey Bill round to um, the River Thames and another one from the River Thames um, up to an area of Norfolk known as the Wash. So within each of these cells sediment is moved around so we would have sediment moving around this cell and we would have sediment moving around this cell here and we would have sediment moving around this one but we wouldn't have very much transfer of sediment between these cells this is what we mean by them being self-contained um, the processes that are operating in one cell don't really have much of an impact on the processes and operating um, in a different cell. It's a little bit like the concept of a drainage basin, really, um, which we've looked at when we've learnt about rivers, um, where we can divide the, the country up into a series of drainage basins. We can do the same with our coastline and we can divide them up into a series of sediment cells. They're often separated from each other um, by quite well-defined boundaries. So either prominent headlands like um, Portland Bill, for example, um, or Selsey Bill or Land's End um, or St David's Head. They're all good examples of very large headlands, um, which act as kind of barriers that the sediment can't move past. Alternatively, they might be separated by areas of quite deep water, um, like the Severn Estuary or the Thames Estuary or um, the area of the, the Wash. Those areas of deep water also act as a barrier to the movement of sediment between one cell and another. Now, as we'll see in a moment, we can also divide larger cells up into what we call sub cells. So within this stretch of coastline between um, Portland Bill and Selsey Bill in the south of England, actually that is then divided up further um, into a series of smaller cells. Now, within any sediment cell, there are different sources of sediment, different ways in which sediment can be added into um, the system. So um, that might take uh, the form of weathering and erosion and mass movement. So maybe some of the cliffs along the coastline um, are experiencing um, erosion or, or weathering and mass movement, which is going to add material into the coastline. Rivers are an important source of sediment. Um, rivers flowing down into the sea bring fine sand and silt and mud with them. Um, in some sediment cells, as much as 90% of the input of sediment into the coastal zone is actually um, from rivers. So rivers play a really important part in terms of transporting material into the coastal zone. Um, material can obviously also move along the coast, so um, we do get longshore currents moving material perhaps from one subcell um, to the next. Um, we also get sediment transferred from offshore, so either by currents or waves or tides moving water around our cell, they're also going to be perhaps bringing material um, in with them. 
The other thing that plays a role as well are marine organisms. So um, particularly if you think about kind of tropical um, islands where you see these beautiful white sand beaches, they've been formed by the breakdown of marine organisms like coral. So when that coral dies um, and is broken down through um, the process of attrition into sand, that's what creates those beautiful white sand beaches that we see in, um, in tropical regions. Um, so all of those different sources are um, different kind of inputs, if you like, into any particular sediment cell. Once we have that input of sediment, the sediment is then moved around um, and it's moved around primarily by longshore currents or what we call littoral currents. So they work to essentially redistribute um, the sediment within the cell or within the subcell. So they will be moving sediment along the coastline um, or adding um, or removing sediment from some of the sinks. So while the sediment is gained from these sources, it can also be in effect lost or stored um, in what we call sinks. So you'll remember that we've covered the concept of a sink when we've looked at the carbon cycle. A sink is a store isn't it, of carbon. And the same concept can be applied to sediment and, and sediment cells. So a sink in the concept of a sediment cell is anywhere that sediment, like sand, is stored for a brief period of time. Um, that could be, for example, on a beach. So a beach is an accumulation or a store of material. The same for spits or bars or tombolos um, or even sand dunes. But we can also find sediment stored offshore, either as offshore bars, um, or sandbanks. These are basically accumulations of sediment that occur further out to sea, almost like a submerged beach, if you like, um, further out to sea. We will look at those in more detail um, in a future lesson when we look at depositional landforms. But it's important to remember that sediment can be stored within a sediment cell offshore. So in terms of trying to put this theory into a little bit of context then, the map that you've got on the screen here shows um, the sediment cell or the subcell, I should say, um, for part of um, the stretch of coastline between Portland Bill and Selsey Bill. It looks particularly at the movement in and around Christchurch Bay, okay, so between Dorset um, and Hampshire. So on one end of our sediment cell, we've got Hengisbury Head. So this is our kind of barrier, if you like, on one side of our sediment cell. And on the other side of our sediment cell or our subcell, we've got this deep stretch of water here um, where the River Solent um, meets the English Channel. So just between um, Southampton and, and the Isle of Wight. So these dotted lines here mark the edges of our, our little sediment subcell. And you can see if we look at these red arrows um, on the map that sediment is being either added to the sediment cell or it's being moved around the sediment cell um, or possibly being added to um, some of our sinks like this offshore um, sand bank here known as the shingles um, or this one here dolphin bank or pot bank. Um, these are examples of these sand banks that I was talking about earlier. So perhaps places like High Cliff or Barton or Beckton, um, cliff erosion here is adding material into our sediment cells. So these are some inputs of sediment um, into our system. We've got longshore currents here, or these littoral currents, which are moving sediment along the coastline. So taking it from High Cliff past Barton and Beckton down towards um, Hurst Castle Spit. So Hurst Castle Spit would be a good example of um, one of the sinks that we talked about earlier. The same per perhaps for some of the beaches um, that might be dotted around um, this stretch of coastline between Christchurch Harbour and the Spit itself. Um, the salt marsh behind the Spit um, and these sandbanks that I mentioned earlier would also be good examples of sinks within the sediment cell. So we can see here how the movement of that material is pretty much self-contained. Um, we've got some inputs of sediment from the cliff erosion or um, from the river sediment maybe being brought down um, from the river Solent. 
and we've got movement of material around the cell and we've got some stores of material as well like the beaches and the spit and the sandbanks. Here's a slightly more detailed um, example of a different subcell. This is the sediment cell that um, is between West Bay and Portland Bill, so the area around Chesil Beach. And again, we can see we've got some different inputs um, and movement of sediment. So in terms of inputs, we can see these green arrows here um, represent um, cliff or coastal erosion. Um, so erosion of material from here. Uh, we've got fluvial or river sediment um, being added in um, at Abbotsbury and at Smallmouth here. We've got um, longshore or littoral drift of material moving in, actually in both directions along this beach. So we've got some sediment moving in one direction and some sediment moving in another direction. And then we've also got this offshore sediment transport where material is perhaps being moved around offshore, um, is being added to or lost from some of these sandbanks like the West Shoal um, or from Portland Bank here. So again, we can see how um, the sediment along the coastline is being moved around in one of these little subcells. Final thing to mention in the context of sediment cells is the idea of sediment budgets. Um, just like any other budget, this is the balance between inputs and outputs. And in this case, we're talking about the inputs, which usually come from erosion or possibly from um, river material. And then the outputs, um, which take place through deposition. And the balance between those is known as the sediment budget. Where the inputs exceed output, so where we have more um, inputs from erosion than we do deposition, um, then we're going to have a positive budget and a, and a surplus um, of sediment. Um, whereas somewhere with a negative sediment budget um, is where the loss of sediment is going to be greater than any inputs into that system.